Hello everyone and welcome to this course on modern application development. So to understand how MVC or models like that can be used in the context of a web application, we need to understand requests and responses. Right? And we can take the example of a dynamic web page. Right? The view over here is essentially the page as presented to the user. And what happens in a web page? What do you really have to interact with? There are clickable links, right? And clicking on each link will take you typically to a new page, or it might just select certain kinds of options and modify the existing page in some ways, right? By the original definition of the web, of course, clicking on a link just takes you to a new page. It creates a new request to the web server. And most likely what the server is going to do is go back, load the page corresponding to that and send that back to you. Right? because all the web server was doing was picking up HTML files and sending them back to the user. Now at present things have changed a little bit of course right uh, servers tend to dynamically generate the messages that need to be sent back to the user. So how does that work in practice? In general now you need to start thinking of clicking a link as not just requesting a new page but triggering certain kinds of behavior. It can trigger changes on the server side, but at the end of the day, finally, it will come back to the user as something that they see. Okay, So I just want to sort of pinpoint a couple of specific uh, examples over here. <clears throat> what I have is, I mean, this was a course on NPTEL that I had taught a couple of years ago. And you will notice that, you know, this, this is the view, right? This is the page that is presented once a user logs in. Okay, so there is clearly some content over here. There is a heading which basically gives the title of the course and also some kind of navigation information. There are certain announcements and some other uh, tabs up there on top. Out here is there is a course outline. So on the left hand sidebar, there is a course outline which helps us to navigate through the different weeks, right? And over here, there is the overall body of the page which sort of tells us, okay, you know, this is the content. This is what you expect to read, okay? Now, this is one way of laying out a page, right? You might find that, for example, in certain cases, this could have got collapsed into the side somewhere else, right? Uh, depending on how you're trying to make this mobile friendly, either the title and uh, navigation bar could have been made into, you know, the three bar icon or something like that. But broadly, this is a useful layout when you are trying to convey something that, you know, the bulk of the information occupies a large part of the page out here. And the rest of it essentially acts as some kind of navigation. Could this have been done better? Quite possible, right? I mean, maybe, you know, you did not need so much space for the navigation. Perhaps this could adapt differently depending on the screen size. What I have put over here is only a part of the total screen, by the way. So, you know, it's not as though the navigation actually takes up one fourth or one third of the screen space, right? So there could have been some changes, but again, it's subjective at that point. Now, the interesting thing to note over here is right on top, right? You can see the URL. In this case, it says onlinecourses.nptel.ac.in. As you know, that essentially refers to the server itself, right? So that's the domain name of the server that hosts this application. Is it one single machine somewhere? Is it a you know, whole bunch of machines somewhere in the Google Cloud? We don't know and we don't actually care, right? All that it matters is any request sent, in, so the first thing that would happen is I would need to look up the IP address corresponding to this domain name, send a request to that IP address, and somebody at the other end, is it like one server or you know one out of n servers? We don't really know, we can't, we can't know, and we don't really care. One of those servers will respond. Now, what does a server need in order to respond? It needs further information about what kind of page I'm looking for, right? And that essentially comes once again as part of the URL. Okay, so this slash noc19 underscore e70 was the code given to the course that I taught, right? So you can see over here that this part of it appears right here. And under that, it also has another part of the URL which says underscore uh, slash course, okay? So clearly what it's telling you is that I want to go to this server. I want to ask it information about this course, right? And what kind of information about the course? Well, this last part out here, the user email is probably optional. It should not ideally be required in this because after all, I am logged in when I'm looking at this, right? So probably even without having that information, it should have been able to show me the same page, right? But when I go to this page, essentially it knows that it's supposed to show me the outline corresponding to the course. 
And one of the links that I have over here, for example, corresponding to assignment zero, if I look at it and sort of zoom in further, I find that that link essentially corresponds to this. What I have shown here is just a zoomed in version of the URL, right, which sort of appears only at the bottom of the screen. Now you can see that that URL has a similar structure. It once again has the same domain name for the server. Once again, it has the NOC 19 underscore EE 70, which sort of tells the server that, you know, this is what I'm interested in. But now instead of course, it says this is assessment. So a quiz or an assignment is essentially related to the assessment data type inside my system, right? So in other words, as far as the user is concerned, they see something referred to as a quiz. But inside the system, it is referred to as an assessment, okay? Why choose these names? That depends on the developer, right? At the end of the day, most users are not really looking at the URL. They are interested in this. As long as they understand what's written over here, there could be changes over here which you are not particularly concerned about. Having said that, it does make sense to give it a logical name so that you, know, you look at it and even if someone looks at the URL, they should be able to get an idea of what you are trying to do. So in other words, what you can see is this URL has encoded some information which is then sent to the server and appropriately pulls it out. So just by having that information there, the request that is sent to the server, right, which will basically contain this entire path name out here, will have enough information that the server can respond appropriately. Now, if I actually click on that link, what I'll find is that, you know, it basically loads assignment zero, okay. And of course, in this case, the due date has passed. So, you know, it doesn't really allow me to do very much, but you can see that on this page now, there are a few other options, right? So it has, for example, a choice button, which allows me to click on something, <clears throat> right? And in fact, if I go look at the URL out here, I see that now it's looking at something called unit, okay? So under assessment, it then sort of goes under unit, which is basically one of the modules which is used inside this, right? So if you start digging into the code of what is happening out here, you will find that ultimately this is also building up on a similar kind of framework. There are models called units, right? Some of those units have the type assessment. The assessments basically have certain kinds of views associated with them, which basically allows me to show it to you like this, right? If it was on a mobile phone, it would probably look slightly different. So the view could be adapted depending on what the user is using to look at it. And finally, this part of it, which is in the URL, is actually each time I click on something, it is telling me what needs to be done, right? So clicking on quiz assignment zero, for example, is a way of invoking a controller that tells the server that I now need to pull out data from the model corresponding to assignment zero and send back that view, okay? So the controller decides which model needs to be sort of poked to get data out of it and which view needs to be rendered to the user, okay? So it's tied tightly to both, but it's the controller that actually decides what shows up at the end. Similarly, if I go click on one of these buttons, there will be an associated controller. There could be, I mean, you know, because of the way the web works, it might be that, you know, it just allows me to select all the buttons and then click on submit. Or alternatively, it might be that every time I click on a button, it automatically invokes a controller, which does something, okay? Both of those are options. But you can see what's happening. There are requests being sent each time we want a change back to the server and the server's response is what finally shows up at our end. So the web, because it is based completely on this idea of clients making requests and servers sending back responses, means that if we want to implement MVC or any other kind of model like that, we need to do it using this pattern, right? So the approach that has been taken is that, you know, basic requests just, such as just clicking on a link or a URL will essentially invoke the HTTP GET request, right? That's the most basic form of HTTP. The most fundamental thing that you can do in the hypertext transfer protocol is to request a web page, request a URL, okay? We call, we automatically tend to say request a web page, but in fact, you are only requesting, sending a request for a URL. Is that actually a page or is it something that, you know, just does something at the back end? It may not even send you back any information. Right? That is why I'm saying that there's a difference between requesting a page and requesting a URL. All that you can do is request a URL. In most cases, that will give you back a new view, which we think of as a page. Okay. Now, that is the most basic form, but 
clearly more complex approaches can be taken as well right and the sort of most common one that we know of is a form submission right a form could be something which basically allows you to type in your name uh, some information about yourself maybe a small text box that allows you to you know fill out a little bit of detail and finally click on submit and in most cases when you have a form of that sort you will find that the http method that is used in order to communicate back to the server is not a get but instead a post request right and the reason for using post is that it allows multiple pieces of data to be encoded neatly into the message to be sent without sort of making a mess of the url that you are sending across right so the url looks clean the posted data is like nicely encapsulated encoded to prevent sort of mangling in different ways and posted into the server so that the server can just pull that out and do what it needs to with it so what this means is that any page or any url can be requested right and in the example that i gave you could have assignments you could have quizzes you could have lectures you could have general information about the course or about the website itself right all of those could finally be something that comes back as a response to a click so one question that we can ask is okay you know so fine i build the swim platform right it has all this you know quizzes and lectures and various other things i then go and decide to build something else maybe a shopping cart application i decide i'm going to recreate amazon or flipkart right now once again over there instead of quizzes and lectures and assignments i have objects that can be bought i have shopping carts i have users right instead of students but very similar kinds of ideas so the question that comes up basically is are there common threads that we can try and exploit over here to reduce sort of you know duplication of effort and once again see what are we looking for a design pattern okay now going back to the example that we had when we were talking about models right we were talking about a grade book where we would have students the students id name address etc would be stored in the student model you would have courses which once again would have a unique id but then also a name a department year offered and so on and then a student course relationship right which is not exactly a model it's a table in the database but usually not thought of as a separate model in itself right which basically tells you which students are registered for which course how many marks they got and so on okay and this was sort of the structure that we used in order to represent it right basically tables you have one table which has names and id numbers for students another one which has course ids and course names and you know other things that sort of had the relationships between them and so on but the important point is that you know you can think of a certain typical set of operations right as a user of such a grade book application one of the things i would want to do is to be able to add new students to the system right so then what do i need to do i need to type in their name roll number date of birth maybe address things of that sort i want to create a new course right which department which year is it offered what's the name of the course are there any prerequisites things of that sort i want to be able to assign students to courses right i want to be able to enter marks for a student at the end of the course or maybe you know let's say there was a makeup exam or a supplementary update certain marks right change the marks of the student see what happens i also want to be able to view summaries or histograms right of marks uh, charts showing the pass percentage or the average marks once i'm done with a course i would probably want to archive an old course right make it either read only or even get rid of it altogether and similarly once a student graduates probably there's no further need to have them around in the system can i sort of remove their information right obviously i take a backup but they don't need to be in the live system at some point right now these are obvious sort of common ideas that you can think of and if you think carefully about it there are some core functionality that can be distilled out of this okay which leads us to the idea of crud 